I'm sorry. Um, do you know uh, Quarto, like the new thinking of R Markdown? It looks no, like a no. Quarto presentation. Oh, okay. No, it's just a PowerPoint. I didn't really have time to do oh, the okay. Quarto. So I just did a summary of the chapter because uh, as I was looking at the, the one that the notes that they have here on chapter 17, that's really little. So I was just trying to add on my own notes as I'm reading the chapter. But uh, we most probably can use the textbook one too. Uh, but I'm just using this one. All right, let me adjust things. All right, so chap um, chapter 17 is just about encoding uh, categorical data. So let's talk about the first part. So in the first part they talk about is really encoding necessary. So in the appendix A, we all refer back to the book. So they have listed all the models that need to do some pre-processing. So what are the kind of data that you need to encode in order to uh, run the model properly? So most model algorithms will require you to do some form of like transformations or categorical encoding. And just a minority model, such as those tree-based model, nay-based, they can handle the categorical data natively and they do not actually require you to do any form of encoding or transformations. Um, but let's take note that that's a more complex, if you do a more complex encoding, right, it often do not result in a better performance. So sometimes maybe just using dummy encodings or, uh, sorry, just using dummy encodings might actually just be equivalent, have equivalent performance as those that use complex encoding. And But if you do a more complex one, uh, if you just do a dummy coding or often or you do not do any form of encoding, you might require more time, but it does not mean you you will have a better model performance. So the model performance will be about the same, but if you don't do encoding, usually you will need more time to train your models. So their suggestions is always starts with a untransformed categorical variable if the model allows for that. But just to be honest, most model algorithms will require you to change your categorical data from a factor, let's say, to a numerical values. So let's, I'm not sure like how familiar. So the one that I use more often is something called the dummy encoding. So in dummy encoding, right, uh, is also known as one hot encoding. So this is the way where you take on a limited or very little, a limited number of categorical data and you try to change it into a numerical format. And Usually in dummy encoding, each of your categorical will be transformed into a binary vector representation, zero or one. So you will have a unique category. Let's say in this case, we will have uh, the building types. So different building types. And you will see for that category, it will be uh, the corresponding dummy variable will be set to one, otherwise it's always set to zero. Why we do this form of encoding is just to ensure that there's no ordinal relationship. So we will talk about ordinal data later on, but this is mostly for those nominal data, those cate categorical nominal data, and there's no ordinal relationship means there's no ranking system involved. Uh, these will be helpful in those kind of like linear regressions, neural networks. And okay, the problem with dummy coding, right? So dummy coding is the most common uh, techniques for handling categorical data in machine learning. But the problem is it can lead to high dimensionality. So when you have a categorical variables with many unique levels, you might have too many categoricals. 
So too many columns. Okay, so in those case, usually if you do those like uh, uh more uh what techniques then uh the feature hashing those will be more encouraged. So next part is okay. So this is also categorical data, but this is for encoding the ordinal predictors. So for certain categorical data, we might have some form of ranking, for example, like a Likert skills, you might have the pleasant to very unpleasant, or sorry, unpleasant to a very pleasant, or satisfied to satis unsatisfactory to satisfactory, or low, medium, high, or gold, uh, gold, silver, bronze, those come with ranking data. So in base R, the default one is to use to create a new numerical columns. So you use a polynomial expansion. So, but in tiny models, what they are um, considering is you can try the recipe steps related to order factors, such as step and order, where you convert to regular factors, or you can use a step ordinal score. This will map a specific numerical values to each factor level. So for example, those like um, step and order, I think this one where I was looking at it, they convert it into like zero, one, two, those kind of like, um, or they have like one, two, three. But I'm not sure about this step ordinal score because I, I forgot what I read earlier. <laughs> I, think, I think it provides um, the like a new model matrix for uh, um, for the different variables or the different factor levels. Um, and it has like, um, like a pyramid shape of the, um, how to say, for each like row and column. If you just like return to the, like the matrix for the uh, building type of the encoding, um, I can, you know, annotate on the screen, um, you know, in the in the tidy models with our uh, website. Mm -hmm. In the uh, tidy models website, is it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, exactly. Wait, is it? Is, yeah, exactly. Is so I think exactly just go a little bit upwards to the to the one matrix one one to the top, like table seventeen point one. 17.1. Yeah, but this exactly. is dummy encoding. Right? Yeah, so yeah, so step ordinal makes it like something like this. Like this is, I think, the the default for um, oh, oh, the Pira. Yeah, and so um, or you know, vice versa, it can go like from um, you know, it can have like the values over here instead of uh, like below the diagonal. But the idea is, um, wait, why can I? Okay, undo. Um, so I think the idea is that um, each different variable I like, gets like um, a, a score, you know, so, um, so uh, two uh, family condo is four and duplex is three and townhouse is one and so forth. I, I think the better way to do it is like the other way around, like to encode above the diagonal rather than below, but and then it goes like from one to four. But then like each mm -hmm. factor level is like gets one more score, so, so to say. And I think you can provide the step ordinal function with an argument of a specific model matrix. For example, if you want it to be like uh, uh, something like this, like here it had two, three, four, one, two, three, I don't know. For some mm -hmm. reason that's the matrix you want. I think you can create a matrix like this and pass it as an argument to step ordinal score. There is there yes, a default that I was you reading? can pass it anything, it will Sorry. assign things. Sorry, 
Um, so is there a default value that you can not pass step ordinal anything and will it kind of assign default values or do you always have to pass it something? I think it's like the one, two, three, four pyramid, but we can check the, the documentation. Uh, wait now. Let me see. Um, this one, right? Step out in the scores. So yeah, look at the details section uh, down below. Yeah. And you can see it, it says by default, the translation uses a linear scale, one, two, three, and so forth. But custom score functions can also be used. Okay, so you pass a function, you don't pass a, a, a matrix. Yeah, right? so function let's say functions. here is the order type and Field levels, factor field levels. Um, so I think this is quite similar to what I'm more used to be doing. Like, but I think I didn't use this kind of border matrix. Like for my case, right? Let's say usually on the Likert scale, I have like five categorical. So what I was doing was more of a I set one of the category as a base then the rest is I have this positive negative integers to counter one and because in this case right usually you have one negative and one positive then you can compare these two groups that's how I've been doing but I don't know why there's a one negative nine here I because think that's theoretically, the polynomial expansion default by base R, this one. And the uh, ordinal score one is like just a bit lower after the prep uh, function. Because for me, I always thought I have to add up everything so that it adds up to zero score. That's how I learned it. But I think because the encoding that I'm usually doing, I couldn't find in the tidy model book. But uh, let's go on. <laughs> then um, let's say okay. So this is the most interesting one is using the outcome for encoding predictors, which is the effect encoding. This is something new. So what happens is they replace the original categorical, or you we encode the categorical variables um, and using and change it into a single numeric columns using the effects of the dependent variable, means the response variable. So this one works really well when you have a lot of categorical. So especially if you want to capture how each categorical affects the likelihood of a particular outcome. So how the effect encoding works is you will first like calculate the two values and then you will have the overall probability of the negative class, like let's say all the zeros one, and then you will encode the category using these two values. So in tidy models, you have this embed package, which includes several recipe steps. So you can have the Lancome GLM one, the mixed one or the base one. So in GLM, you're just using the generalized linear model or you use a mixed effect model or variations. You estimate the effect of each level of the categorical predictors based on the outcome, means your response variable. So um, they have this, you say when you're using like recipes, right? You have to specify the variable being encoded first and then the outcome using the WAS. So let me show you. Um, here, right, it actually shows how to encode it. So you first, right, you have this training data. So the, the response variable is actually sales price. So the categorical in this case is actually neighborhood. So because this is based on different neighborhoods, they have too many uh, categorical columns. So what they do is they 
do this effect encoding based on the outcome, which is the sales price. Okay, so after that, you will have these all these values. So these are the values like um associated to each of these categorical data. So the good thing is this encoding, right? What's interesting is they say it seems that it can handle situations where you have a new factor level encounter. So let's say you have like very lack of information about this neighborhood or maybe few data. This um this effect encoding still able to generate a value of for you based on the outcome variables. Okay, next. So the thing is, effect encoding is really powerful, but you should use it definitely. And with cat. So the effect encoding is very prone to overfitting if you don't use it. Uh, carefully. So one thing was I was looking at it is they say to mitigate the risk, we should use it with techniques like uh, smoothing and regular like regularizations when you apply the encoding process. So these techniques will make sure if you have a category with very few samples, limited samples, or you have a category with very extreme target variables, the proportions will be adjusted so that you can prevent overfitting. Uh, but overall, you can, what is recommended is you should try different techniques and then and experiment different techniques and just validate their effectiveness. So just try out different pre-processing. Um, so make sure you regularly resample. So check back the chapter 10. Um, when you are also creating effect encodings for your categorical variables, like th think of it, you are actually layering a mini model because basically you run a, a GLM or mix or bits first inside, then based on that, you have that values and then you run another model. So basically you have one mini model inside your actual model. Okay, so... The possibility of all fitting is also they suggest you must consider something called the feature engineering, which we have described in cover in chapter seven. Okay, so one good way is effect encoding with partial pooling. Okay, so this part is when this applies. So let's say based on that neighborhood data. So if we look back into this thing, so you might have many categories, categories and some of example for neighborhood, some of the neighbors, you might have few data sets. So then some category, some categories, you might have more data set. So partial pooling um, works really well when you have a category with a few data sets, so not too much. So remember, because when you're doing um, effect encoding, you're actually generating the values, right? Based on your outcome variables. So one good thing is they show us this graph where, okay, so if you do effect encoding with partial pooling and actually no pooling. So partial pooling, one good thing is, um, you will have those estimates with few data with it will be pulled towards the mean effect. Give me a second here. So if you have like certain cat, sorry. So if you have a certain category like, um, with just a few data, so you're not able to get the real estimates, right? But if we do a partial pooling, we can string the effect estimates towards the mean, then even though we do not have much evidence about the data. And the graph, um, what I just show you that figure. So most estimates, right, will be about the same when you could consider a full pooling versus a partial pooling. So this is the figure that we ran it. So 
you see like those smaller dots, right? Actually means they have like fewer data sets, but the outcomes should be about the, if, about the same for those effect encoding. They will just pull it towards the center, which is the diagonal. Um, what else? Uh? Let me think of it. Uh, so when we're looking into partial pooling, right? So partial pooling, they say, is based on the Bayesian statistical concept. So it allows a compromise between fully independent, like means no pooling at all, with a fully shared. So this is a, a synthesis between these two, like no pooling versus comp complete pooling. So when you do this partial pooling, the effects will not be entirely independent, but it will be influenced by information from other categorical. Okay, so partial pooling actually helps us to regular regularize the effects by borrowing information from other categorical, especially when we have a very limited data about that specific categorical. And one very good advantage about that they mentioned on Google is partial pooling actually provides you a balance between capturing categorical specific effects and leveraging information from other categorical, even when the data is limited. And the thing, this advantage is it can be computationally intensive and it requires really a lot of expertise, especially in Bayesian modeling techniques. Then, Next part is done with this. This one is also a new thing that I just learned. It's called feature hashing. So this is a method where we create a dummy variables. Okay. And you consider, but you only consider the value of the categoricals uh, to assign it to a predefined pool of dummy variables. This is for tech data. And for data with high cardinality, so means you have too many categoricals. So in R, we do it is using the R lang package and using the hash functions. So for example, if we're looking back to the AIMS data, you can, the neighborhoods data that is a categorical and we can call this a key. Then we can generate an output also known as hashes and this of it, it will become a new numerical values. So using these hash functions, right, it takes in an input of a variable size, then you map it into output of a fixed size. Okay, the thing is, um, later I do want to talk about this collision because I look into this also. So if we look into this feature hashing, so what you will have the train data, right? So then after that, you can use this hash function. So they will create something called this hash. Okay, so it's just a generated number zero to nine, A to F. So they actually generates, if you use this hash function, right, it generates the 128-bit hashes, means you have two to the power of 128 possible hashes volume. So what happens is here you have these substrings. So based on these hash values that you have generated, this is looking at taking into the string number order 26 to 32. Okay, and then because you will have too many numbers, right, it will create high cardinality, too high dimensions, you have too many dimensions. So what you want to is, is you want to change it to base 16, means you change it to 16 categoricals, you can then you can string the number of categoricals group. And then you can convert like start a uh, string to integer, convert it into a value. Okay. This is using the modulus functions, means you divide by 16. So in the end, your hash will only, instead of like many numbers and alphabets, it will just become like a few. Okay, 
The problem is with this, like let's say you have 100 over neighborhoods. It's really good because then you now reduce it into 16 neighborhoods because 16 hashes. The thing is, this method will create a very fast memory efficiency and it can be a very good strategy because then you can string a great number, hundreds over number of categorical into like tens or twenties categorical group. And they talk about you can use this stat dummy hash. So it's about the same. So sign here refers to whether you want it to be positive, negative. But the number terms is they actually, in this example, they string it the neighborhood to 16, 16 groups. Okay, the few thing is, this is the problem. So let's say you have over 100 and you try to string it to 16. So you will create a problem called collision or aliasing. One good example is you see here the number of currents we have 16, right? But the num the only one like number of neighborhoods, you only have few neighborhoods that don't actually catch me. Some of the neighborhoods will be assigned back to the same hashes. Okay. The problem with doing this hashing is since you have multiple categoricals can hash to the same hashes or buckets. So you have the po possibility of creating different types of category. I'm not, not sure whether it makes sense. So you have like maybe categoricals that are really irrelevant, like two different neighborhood, but they are actually mapped to the same dummy variable, which is the same hash. So the problem with this is it can lead to a loss of information because you're trying to group Things, and this could put, potentially affect the model performance. The other one is when you try to, you lose a lot of this individual data and when you try to group them into like smaller numbers of categorical group, um, the resulting hash features might not be interpretable as those dummy encoding because you don't have a direct mapping between the categoricals and the outcome okay so in summary what i was like trying to say is feature hashing is a very good technique if you want to hash categorical labels into a fixed number of uh, bu hash buckets okay and it helps to re uh, reduce your dimensionality cardinality while preserving still certain information about the categorical, but it is very important to take note of the potential hash collision, and you need to make sure you carefully select the number of hash buckets to balance the dimensionality reductions and information retention. So, like, what's the best hash, like 16 or maybe 20? Like, it really depends on how many categories, categories that you have to begin with. Um, let me think. Uh, did I mention all the things? Uh, then... Yeah, I think I can. Okay. Then... And um, okay, so I mentioned about the interpretation, so you cannot just easily interpret because it cannot be reversed, and you cannot determine which input categories were from the hash values. Um, so you should try different values to determine what is best for your particular modeling approach. And when you have a lower number of hash, because you hash buckets, you definitely will have more collisions. But a high number may not be improved because then you will have the original high cardinality. You're not reducing dimensions. So think of it like the one that we learned last week about dimension reduction. So hash is just one of the techniques to reduce like similar categories into certain hash buckets. Um, then the sign true just means whether you assign to a positive negative. Okay, the final 
other one that I read. So it's called the entity embedding. So this one is a technique where you transform categorical variables into many levels using a set of lower dimension spectrums. So this is very suitable for those nominal data, like neighborhoods, for example, where you have many categorical levels. Okay, in the embed fun package, you can just use it the step embed functions. And what other thing? Um okay, so entity embedding is they provide a, a way for us to transform high cardinality categorical variables into lower. Uh, sorry, to, for us to capture the complex relationships between um, categoricals. When they mean by high cardinality categorical variables means you have uh, variables with many unique levels. So for example, those participants ID or latitudes, geographical ID or GPS, those kind of stuff. Um, the idea between these entity embeddings, right, is the model will learn the optimal representations for each categorical instead of just manually define the mapping between categoricals and vectors. Okay, so you actually do the embedding through the model training process. That's why you need to train the models before that. And so let me think of so for example you have a categorical variables like neighborhood with many unique neighborhood names okay so using the entity embedding your neighborhood names will be transformed into lower dimensional ve vectors for example let's say um what's give me a few names um for example, North Ames, right? Then you will have like maybe represented as a vector like 0 0.8, comma 0 0.2, negative 0 0.1. Okay, then you might have like North Park Villa then represented as a vector where like 0 0.7, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.2. So you have these like vectors, think of it like the matrix vector. And then what happens is the model usually will learn this representation in the ways that let's say you have neighborhoods with similar characteristics or relationship. They will usually have the similar embeddings, means similar vector. So the model will make a informed predictions based on these categorical predictors and then group them together. So it's quite a technique for dimension reduction like that. So the so technique is when question. you do this, like, mm. yeah. So um, ju just to clarify, because I'm not that familiar with this technique. So this is kind of like um, similar to PCA in the in the in the in the view that it like or more like a more of a classification uh, pre-processing. Uh, technique where uh, like based on the outcome variable this specific technique um, like neural uh, network finds the mm -hmm. most similar um, predictors or, or meta predictors groups based on the outcome variable is this correct yeah so I'm actually not familiar with this method too so I was looking at it as well so what happens is, right, so they will have come up with, I'm not sure I can annotate. So let's say they have something like a vector, like 0 0.2. So it's like three values when I was looking at the example. They will have something like uh, x, y, z, something like a number between negative 1 to positive 1. So it would be like something like a vector, something like this for each of the neighborhood. So what happens is they will 
let's say you have 100 over neighborhoods, means you will have 100 over vectors, right? So those vectors with uh, similar embeddings referring to these values here in the vector, similar one, they will be grouped together. So it's like the one like just now where you mentioned, like uh, what was it, uh, the random forest where everything similar grouped together. So then they will divide it into like smaller categorical data based on this vector. It seems that way. I'm not sure is that clear enough. Um, I'm not sure also, but I'm again, I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm equipped to understand the answer. So uh, I think that that's the best I can do at the moment, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it seems to be like they are running one model so it's something like a machine learning model where they train, like you have 100 neighborhoods, then you have all these unique vector. And based on the, I'm not sure how they, because they just mentioned it briefly, like it seems that the machine learns neighborhood with same vectors or what they call as embeddings, they will be categorized together. Means there must be a range of like how they cut it into category. But I I didn't go further than that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then. Um. Ta -ta. So. Uh. So it's more like what you say, neural network. That this one is one that I really could not understand, but it seems to be based on the weight of evidence. This encoding method actually transform a set of categorical levels based on their associations with your binary outcome means zero one. So they use some form of algorithms based factors and just create a new dictionary mapping. So this was in the last part of that section and they didn't mention much about this. But it, it seems that if you guys are interested, you can instill in the embed package where you can use the step book. So all in all, the summary. So the most straightforward option is always just do dummy variables. And maybe from there, you can do a more complex encoding. Okay. But because dummy, uh, var uh, dummy coding does not work well when you have a variables with high cardinality, means too many levels, right? But you can also think of like more, more complex encoding will be like effect encoding that uses outcome hashing functions. You set it to a you use neural network or the weight of evidence transformation. So that's all. I hope it's clear that <laughs> anyone else have any? Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I think I've, um, uh, first of all, thank you for making this so clear. Um, uh, for me uh, personally, this chapter was like, first of all, it was really like concise, like very like more like, pretty short and like very focused. Um, and like I found the ideas here very valuable. Like the idea, for example, of the uh, partial pooling, which like makes a lot of sense for me. Like this idea of like, um, like putting more weight around like towards the mean if the group is, is smaller. So for me, it was like really interesting and I might, mm -hmm. I might use it in a future project. Um, just like a very short note on uh, one hot encoding. Um, mm -hmm. You said like uh, there's a small difference between uh, dummy encoding and one hot encoding. Uh, where in dummy encoding, you no, use... Dummy encoding, I think is no... I thought dummy encoding is also one hot encoding. Yeah, so so there's, there is a small difference between them. It's pretty small. So, oh. um, uh, so dummy encoding means like it was like how they showed the example where you uh, select one of the of the levels of the factor and you treat it as a as a reference um for mm -hmm. example here yeah the one fam uh, level where it gets like zeros all the way all the time mm -hmm. yeah 
And one hot encoding means that every um, that every factor level gets one. Um, so this means like there is no uh, there is no um, a reference level. Like there is no level for the factor that is all zeros. Um, which, as I understand, is useful for some cases. For example, if you encounter like a novel factor level, which you didn't account for during your original um, uh, training, then it's like all zeros or, of, I don't know, like um, not, uh, none of the factor levels exist uh, within like the data set, like, the, like an empty level, so to say. So um, the, it's a bit different. It, you might consider it like semantic, like you add in like an other um, quote unquote factor level, but uh, but it is a bit different. And also um, inside the the uh, step uh, step dummy uh, function, you have an argument for one hot equals true. So if it's false, which is by default, then that's what happens here. And you can mm -hmm. also use like the true value of the argument, and then you have like a, a longer diagonal, I guess, uh, where like everything gets a one. So mm -hmm. that's just a quick note. And again, thank you so much for presenting the, the chapter and the presentation is great. Another thing is that I think the, I, when I was looking at these encoding methods, right, I saw one that they talk about this binary encoding. So I'm not sure, but it seems that it combines those as like of one hot encoding and the integer encoding. So I think in the technique, each of the categories, let's say they will first be assigned a unique integer. So then it's either zero or what. Then this one, this integer seems to be later they convert it to a binary code. And then each of the binary digits will be treated as uh, separate features. So for example, let's say for color, right? You might have like red, green, blue, yellow. Then you might have color zero, color one. Then like let's say red will be like binary will be zero zero, green will be zero one, then blue will be one zero, then yellow is like one one. So I saw that also, but I think they didn't mention in the book. That's called the binary encoding. But the, the actually when I was like googling right, uh, too many encoding methods for like categorical data, but I think they only cover this view. It, what you said sounds similar to either dummy or one hot encoding, like just in a. No, it's like a, a it's a vector combination. Mm, they call it a combination of one hot encoding, uh, plus integer encoding. Oh okay. Mm. Anyone else have things? Anything that are unclear. Sorry, I yeah. couldn't cover much about the 17.5 because I'm really not familiar with that encoding approach. Um, thank you, Manny. I just wanted to um, mention something about complete pooling and partial pooling. Uh, I'll put something in the chat. Uh, and that is a bit advanced topic because it's about it's the ba uh, base rule book. Uh, which is very good. And uh, I think, uh, uh, so doing this uh, chapter 17, uh, even if it's, uh, you know, applying Bayesian uh, techniques uh, on data to model, for example, you know, runners uh, uh, and uh, they, they, how they perform uh, to fast, if they, 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 they do faster compared to the others and everything. But uh, um, I think that that was very interesting. I don't know if you can, uh, maybe if you are interested in um, the topic to have a look at the, the, that chapter, because it really uh, explains and lets you understand what, what the concept of pooling and partial pooling is. So basically you are uh, on a condition of par uh, complete pooling when you are not considering grouping within your data. So you like making a very basic, simple model with one 
um, uh, response variable and then you use all the others without specifying anything. Um, uh, so you're not making any group uh, within your data. You are not grouping your data. I don't know if you are, we are talking about sales, um, uh, the, the housing, uh, for example, data set. So we are not grouping by district, for example. Okay. Why pooling means grouping. Okay. So we are grouping data. And so the difference between uh, not pooling and pooling uh, it's when you adjusting your model, considering grouping within your data. Mm. Yeah, the only, I, I, just, I find it very interesting because the um, I feel like it's worth looking into this like step line code. So basically, they have these three right. So you will have step line code variations when when you decide on it or you can use the step line code mix or the other one is the step line code gl app so basically i think this is interesting for me because like they use a partial pooling right even when you're using partial pooling you can decide like what kind of modeling that you want depending on your how your data looks like when after you do the all these like exploration data explorations right you can decide whether you want to do a mix GLM or bits. I think these steps is like make it very easy that we can try out different one uh, encoding, like mix all this, then decide. I think using the resampling where to decide which one is a better one. Mm, what else? Uh? Yeah, stop sharing here. Anyone else has things to share or things to add on? No questions, but thank you for the presentation. That was a really nice explanation of everything. Yeah, I feel because this is a shorter chapter. <laughs> That's why. Oh. No, that's good. I mean, there's some complicated parts. 